Good evening. On behalf of the Illinois Holocaust Museum, I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's program, Confronting Anti-AAPI Hate, Building a Foundation for Change. My name is Abby Fishman Romanic. Um, I am a vice president of the board of the Holocaust Museum. Our museum is grounded in the history and lessons of the Holocaust that works to share universal lessons of humanity and generate awareness and action against prejudice, bigotry, and injustices worldwide. Thus, this evening's event brings us together at a time where hate crimes against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have increased. Thousands of hate crimes against AAPI members were reported in 2020 and 2021, ranging from avoidance to verbal attacks to letter writing campaigns to physical assault and online harassment. However, it's not just in response to the pandemic. The United States has a long and often overlooked history of racism and violence against the AAPI community. We are so honored this evening to partner with the Illinois Jewish Legislative Caucus, the Jewish Judges Association of Illinois, the Asian American Judges Association of Illinois, the Alliance of Illinois Judges, and the Asian American Caucus for a discussion with our esteemed panelists this evening, each one working to combat AAPI racism and hate and to educate us about the history and stories of the community and regularly raise awareness of what individuals, communities, and institutions can do to break the silence and change the national discourse on this growing challenge of anti-Asian racism and xenophobia. Uh, these panelists serve as allies in this important work. A quick overview of this evening's run of show. Following what I know will be a thought-provoking moderated conversation with our panelists. We will also open it up to a Q&A and ask that you please type in questions you may have in the Q&A section of your webinar screen. It is now my honor to introduce this evening's panelists. U.S. Senator Tammy Duckworth, who is joining us this evening as part of a pre-recorded interview, is an Iraq War veteran, Purple Heart recipient, and former Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, who was among the first handful of Army women to fly combat missions during Operation Iraqi Freedom. Senator Duckworth served in the reserved forces for 23 years before retiring at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in 2014. She was elected to the U.S. Senate in 2016 after representing Illinois' 8th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives for two terms. This spring, the Senator passed the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, which aims to make the reporting of hate crimes more accessible at the local and state levels by boosting public outreach and ensuring reporting resources are available online in multiple languages. Representative Jennifer Gong Gershowitz is a full-time legislator for the 17th District. She is chairperson for the Immigration and Human Rights Committee and Judiciary Civil Committee. A former litigation attorney at Winston and Strawn, Jennifer is the founding member and co-chair of the Illinois Unaccompanied Children's Task Force and former director of the North Suburban Legal Aid Clinic. Jennifer introduced and was a key sponsor in the 2021 passage of the TEACH Act, which requires every Illinois public elementary school in Illinois um, to include a unit of instruction studying the events of Asian American history in its curriculum. Josina Wing Morita, who unfortunately won't be able to join us for the full um, evening due to um, illness in her family, um, is a commissioner of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. Elected in 2016, she's the first Asian American elected to a countywide board in Cook County, 
the second largest county in the country. As an urban planner and advocate and policy advocate, Josina brings expertise in equity policy, land use, stormwater, and regional planning. She sits on the boards of Woods Fund Chicago and Delta Institute. Josina's human rights, racial justice, and water justice work has been recognized locally and nationally. In 2007, she was named one of the top 35 leaders under 35 fighting racism and poverty in Chicago by the Community Renewal Society. In 2016, she was named one of 50 young Asian American stars in politics by Asian Fortune Magazine. Sung Yun Chamorro is Executive Director of National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum. Prior to this role, Sung Yun was the Director of Organizing at Interfaith Worker Justice, leading collaborative work with various partner organizations, unions, and faith communities in the economic justice movement. Sung Yun has also worked in the AAPI community as a community organizer in Chicago, where she organized a pan-Asian coalition for presidential and mayoral elections, immigration reform, the state budget, and redistricting. redistricting. Sung Yun is board member of HANA Center, a Korean American immigrant rights organization. Esther Herr is our moderator. She is an education consultant with 26 years of experience in facilitation, training, program management, and strategic planning. Her content areas of expertise include Asian American history and racial identity, Holocaust education, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Previously, Esther was the Director of Training and Curriculum Department in the National Education Division of the ADL. She has authored a number of curriculum lessons, journal articles, and blog posts, and has traveled all over the country and internationally to train others on the delivery and practice of diversity, inclusion, and equity programs and principles. Esther is board president of Can Win, a nonprofit organization dedicated to eradicating gender-based violence in, Asian, in the Asian American immigrant community. Thank you for being with us tonight. And with that, I will turn it over to Esther Herr. Thank you, Judge Romanek. Thank you everyone for coming. I want to say a great thank you to three amazing Asian American women uh, who are here today to talk about what is so important, what is in the forefront of many uh, Asian Americans' minds right now, which is the persistence of anti-Asian hate. Uh, we're gonna have an opportunity to hear from all three of them tonight, as well as including Tammy, uh, Senator Tammy Duckworth's clips, as uh, was mentioned before, she was pre-recorded. So we'll be going back and forth live, plus the clips throughout the session. Again, as a nice reminder, please uh, ask your questions using the Q&A button. I also wanna particularly thank uh, Kelly, um, for being a part of this important uh, effort here. Um, and let's go ahead and jump in. And I'd like to start with um, a clip uh, from the Senator about the lack of API representation in the president's cabinet that she spoke out about, that is in March. Um, and so when I uh, asked her about it, you know, what are the consequences of not including AAPI representation in such positions uh, this was her response. Let's take a listen to that. And then I'm going to ask Justina to respond to that uh, clip and that question. Well, ultimately, the consequence is that it weakens our nation. If, if our nation's leadership does not reflect the makeup of the people of this nation, then we are missing out on talent. Um, and frankly, with the president saying, you know, he wants to really pivot to the Asia Pacific region on national security issues. Now we're seeing, you know, with, with trade, uh, how important it is uh, to, to maintain the manufacturing uh, supply chain. We, we've seen these issues, um, um, you know, engagement in the Indo-Pacific region is particularly important for our nation in terms of national security and economic security. Uh, uh, and frankly, I was very disappointed that with the exception of our wonderful vice president, my good friend, um, Kamala Harris, 
this is the first time in over 20 years that a president of the United States has not appointed an AANHPI to a cabinet seat on both sides of the aisle in 20 years. And I, I, I made sure that the administration knew how disappointed I was in that. Um, and it had been an ongoing discussion for quite a while. Um, and it all sort of came to a head when I was watching a, a report that they were giving on the political side about how AAPIs really turned out for the Biden-Harris um, campaign. Um, and they were you know, boasting that the numbers were well above 60%, almost 70% turned out. Um, and I, that's when I said, um, you do realize that for Obama-Biden, it was in the high 80s. You've actually lost ground. And how are you going to gain ground if you don't speak to the issues that are important within this community, which includes education and healthcare and all the things that are important to other communities. But, but when, and then when you have no representation uh, within your own cabinet, and the response I got was, well, we're very proud of Kamala. And I felt that that was very um, offensive because you would never say uh, to someone, well, we have a white president, so you don't need any more white men to be part of the president's cabinet. You wouldn't say that to the black community. Um, you wouldn't say that to the Latino community. Why would you say it to the AAPI community? So um, that's when I said, you know, I've been talking with you and listening to you and, and this shows me that you're not taking this seriously enough. So I boycotted nominations, uh, um, you know, that were not nom diversity nominee nominees. And I will say to the White House's benefit, they responded right away. Um, and, and, and in fact, uh, Senator Maisie Hirono joined me um, and uh, they spoke to both of us and reassured us. And as a result of that, they agreed to, and we now have a senior member in the uh, West Wing who has the capacity to stand up in the Oval Office and say, Mr. President, there's a, there's a problem here. Who is AAPI? So that's Erica Moritsugu, um, uh, uh, who's just wonderful. And um, they've also promised to appoint an AANHPI uh, cabinet member position um, as soon as that's it is, it's they're able to do so, um, and they continue to work with us and and on on many of these issues. So it it took you know unfortunately it took us um, uh, taking that drastic step, but I thought it you know, but it was time, right? And and frankly, it was something I learned from the Tri Caucus, the Congressional Black Caucus, and the Congressional Hispanic Caucus had been doing this. And as soon as I did it, they joined me and, and supported me. So that was what was really great was that Cory Booker immediately tweeted out, Tammy's right, there should be an Asian American, uh, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander on the cabinet. And, and um, you know, the Black Caucus did this, you know, the same thing that the Hispanic Caucus did the same thing. So it was nice to get support from the Tri Caucus community for what we were trying to do. So, uh, Josina, I want to start with you, and I just want to make mention a few things. Uh, you were the first Asian American elected to a countywide board in Cook County, the second largest county in the country. And I know that you, alongside Representative Don Gershwitz, have created the Asian American Caucus. So, kind of given the space that you're in, you know, I imagine you think about this issue a lot. Um, so, any thoughts about the question? Any thoughts about what uh, the senator shared? Absolutely. And uh, thank you, Esther, for moderating tonight. Thank you to Abby and the Holocaust Museum and all of the hosts for holding this conversation. I'm glad that we're continuing to have this conversation. Um, after the Atlanta shooting, sometimes these things have a moment um, and they don't continue. And I think um, it's really important that we continue to have this conversation, you know, and taking a step back on the content, you know, the, the topic of anti-Asian hate. You know, I'm fifth generation Japanese American, sixth generation Chinese American. You know, my family, um, you know, were impacted directly by the Chinese Exclusion Act, impacted directly. My grandmother was in the internment camps, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so this history of anti-Asian hate in the form of, you know, racist acts, but also in, in the form of policy in this country is not new. Um, and I think that as terrible as the Atlanta shootings were, it has heightened this conversation. It has made uh, a lot of Americans aware that anti-Asian racism exists. Um, I think it's also helped people understand that anti-Asian racism is not less violent, not less egregious, um, not less common even than other forms of racism. And I think it's helped us start to have more of a conversation also within the Asian American community, the number of Asian Americans that have reached out over the last year who said, you know, I grit my teeth through all the comments and I'm done. 
Um, and so I think it's an important time for us to continue to tell our stories. Um, and so I think that that's also the context that it was particularly disappointing that the Biden administration did not hear Asian American communities call to have representation um, in his cabinet at a time where it was the highest, I would say, kind of point of attention uh, to the Asian American community and our issues and that failure um, to kind of step up and make sure that we were represented was, you know, particularly uh, difficult for the community to take. And so I think we continue to see that representation matters. Uh, when I moved to Chicago 10 years ago, there was really zero Asian Americans in significant elected offices here in Illinois. And it's amazing uh, with Jennifer and Teresa Moss, Senator Villavalon, we have gone from zero to nine members of the Asian American caucus in just the last five years. You know, almost all of us are first, right? I'm the first Asian American elected countywide. Teresa Ma is the first Asian American in the General Assembly. Ron Villavalon is the first Asian American um, state senator. Um, but our commitment is while we are the first that we will not be the last. And I think that this last legislative session with the TEACH Act um, that Jennifer will talk about is an example of why it is so important to have Asian Americans in elected office in government. Because as they say, you are either at the table or you are on the menu. And our community has been on the menu for way too long and having people at the table um, has been able to push landmark legislation that is going to change the identity um, and understanding of Asian Americans in this state for generations to come. Um, and so that is what representation is about. It's not just about faces in a room, it's about voices at the table and about being able to respond to things like hate incidents, but also all of the pressing day-to-day -day issues that Asian Americans face and for them to see um, somebody who looks like them, but also hear somebody speak on behalf of them and find solutions and really use the tools of government to make their lives better. And so it's really an exciting time for us in Illinois as much as we continue to struggle uh, for political representation. It's an exciting time here and to be the first state in the nation to require Asian American history. Um, you know, we can't thank Representative Gon Gershowitz and Senator Villa Villam and all of those who helped make that happen. Um, and it really makes us proud as Asian Americans in Illinois. Well, thank you for that, Justina. And we will talk about the teach act a little later on in the session, but I wanna stay with political representation, um, you know, in places of decision, that decision-making is happening. Representative Don Grishwitz, can you say a little bit more about what Gina was, Justina was talking about? Yeah, so I just, sorry, I needed to unmute. Um, yeah, I mean, I just picking up on I, what Josina was I, was so eloquently um, highlighting is that, you know, I think, you know, you're hearing a common theme, right, which is that you cannot be what you cannot see. Um, for me, it was a poignant moment, um, you know, last night when I received uh, the Justice Liu Lifetime Achievement Award from the Chinese American Bar Association. Um, you know, we all follow in the footsteps of those who have uh, been trailblazers in our community. Uh, for me, you know, Justice Liu was the, um, the example of what was possible. Um, she was the first Asian American ever elected. She was elected to the eighth judicial subcircuit, uh, the first Asian American uh, to do so. Um, as, a, as a lawyer, um, I did not learn anything about my own family's history until I was in law school. Um, up until studying the Chinese Exclusion Acts, up until having the opportunity to study the constitutionality of the Japanese internment camps, um, I really had no um, way to connect my own family's experience to the experiences of other Asian Americans. Um, I, of course, um, understood my own heritage. I am a third generation Chinese American. Um, but my own grandparents, I think, um, like a lot of immigrant families, um, were really focused on survival. Mm -hmm. um, didn't talk about uh, their experiences of discrimination, um, their experiences as Chinese Americans, um, their journey, their struggle. And so, you know, I didn't have any way to connect my own family's experience 
to the experiences of other Asian American families, to have the opportunity to connect my family's experience to the larger American experience until I connected the dots as an adult. Studying the Chinese Ex Exclusion Acts started to ask questions about my own family's experience. Only then did I ex discover the impact um, of the Chinese Exclusion Acts on my own family. Um, my grandparents fought deportation under the Chinese Exclusion Acts for over a decade, represented by a civil rights attorney who challenged the constitutionality of race-based immigration laws under the Equal Protection Clause of the US Constitution. And it was at that moment as a law student that I understood not only the impact that these race-based uh, laws had had on my own family, but I understood that I had the tools at my disposal as an attorney to create change, to challenge the status quo, um, and to utilize uh, the tools at my disposal um, to make a difference in the lives of, of others. Um, so it was early in my career as a lawyer that I took on um, asylum cases um, challenging uh, us to think about gender-based persecution cases, um, the kinds of harms that happen to women in the world as fundamentally violating our own human rights. It wasn't until I became more uh, you know, seasoned as a lawyer that I saw my own ability and my own experiences as an Asian American um, as relevant to the conversation that we are now having about representation, about how we utilize the tools at our disposal to create change. And it has been my experience now as, as a lawmaker and as a part of the Asian American Caucus that we are able to increase visibility about the issues that impacted our own community. Um, you know, Asian American racism is nothing new. Um, our experience in this country has been a long history of violence and exclusion. Um, exacerbated by moments like the last year where we have been scapegoated for the pandemic. Um, but it has been recent in my life that I have been able to um, engage in conversations with other elected officials, other leaders in our, our community, and have the opportunity to voice our own experiences and connect those experiences to the conversation that is happening throughout our country today um, and be part of that conversation in a meaningful way that has given our community a voice. Um, and that has been a sea change. Um, one that happens when you have representatives from the community. Um, going back to you know, what Senator Duckworth was talking about, you know, having an opportunity to have a platform um, to be a voice for our community that has been incredibly powerful for me. Um, and it's, it's been, um, I think, a, a unique opportunity, um, one that is gaining momentum, um, but one that is relatively new, I think, in some ways. Thank you for that, Representative Gongor Schwitz. Sanyang, I want to pull you in the conversation because you're going to be speaking from a different context, which is around advocacy. And, and, and your work advocating for Asian American women. Can you say a little bit more about why representation in these decision-making circles are important? How does it impact the work that you do with the, with the, with the movement? All right, I finally got unmuting powers. <laughs> so sorry that took a minute there, but... Um, well, thank you for having this conversation and for everyone being here. Um, I personally, as an Asian American immigrant living in the Skokie area with a daughter going to school here at Middleton, really appreciate this uh, opportunity uh, to be among neighbors and um, just um, you know your willingness to really reach out and learn more about what is really going on with us in our community. So thank you for hosting this conversation and inviting us to be um, on this panel. And thank you, Esther, for hosting. Uh, facilitating. Um, so yeah, you know, I think in terms of advocacy and having representation, I mean, it, it makes a difference, right? I mean, um, having people who under like who to with whom you don't have to explain everything 
in seats of decision making and power makes a huge difference, right? And um, you know, I had the opportunity to uh, visit with the president and the vice president at the White House, along with other Asian American, um, you know, uh, uh, activists and advocates and um, community leaders. And I really actually spent my time um, thanking the vice president for speaking up and saying what she said right after the Atlanta shooting, right? That it was so powerful to have a woman of color say, you know, that we, you know, everyone deserves to live with, live in safety, right? Like everyone deserves to go to work um, in safety and not worry about being killed, right? There's a whole different level of empathy and understanding when it's coming from somebody that you know probably have experienced racism and sexism in their lifetime, in their life, right? And so, so everything from that to being able to have conversations like with Senator Duckworth and her staff in the DC office around some of the work that we do, and they get it right away. Like we don't have to spend a whole lot of time explaining to folks why health care, affordable health care and health care access is important, right, for for immigrant and immigrant women, especially, right? And so so there is an element of um, having having folks who not only look like you, but come from similar backgrounds and life stories to be able to say, um, you know, we want to work on this and they understand the why very easily and then can become champions for us to work on, um, you know, getting other folks on board as to why we need um, why we need the policy changes that we need. Thank you, thank you for that. And you know, you were, you were bringing up the murders of uh, six Asian American women in Atlanta earlier this spring. And this brings me to the next part of our conversation, which is the recent passage of the Hate Crimes Act in May this year. Um, I asked Tammy, uh, Senator Tammy Duckworth about that and here are some of her thoughts on that. Well, it was important to pass this legislation because in particular among the AAPI community, AA and HPI community, um, hate crimes are severely, significantly underreported. Um, they're underreported by the community itself and they are not recognized um, by law enforcement also. Oftentimes law enforcement will not see something as being a hate crime. And that's a real issue. And so we wanted to pass this legislation because you know, the FBI's annual review um, of hate crimes confirmed what we saw anecdotally, which is there's been a rise in hate crimes the high, to some of the highest levels in over a decade in 2020. Um, but we also know that there was a significant rise among those hate crimes were against Asian Americans and in particular Asian women. Two thirds of the cr hate crimes that were reported uh, in 2020 um, against AAPIs were actually against women and in particular older Asian women. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that a couple of things happened. One, that we got an accurate tally of the uh, hate crimes, um, because I do think it's underreported. And when it's underreported, what happens within a law enforcement community, they say, well, it's really not happening. We have other things that we have to worry about that is a bigger problem. Well, this is a bigger problem than people realize. And then I started digging into it and I realized that there were things, you know, that, that um, really prevented hate crimes from being accurately reported. For example, um, if, some, if somebody was a victim of crime, say a, a Korean corner grocery store was targeted and, and is robbed and vandalized, um, if the person doesn't write racist language on the wall and graffiti or, or, or say racist things as they leave, um, it doesn't get reported, as, it's just reported as a robbery. And yet they were targeted because they were Asian American. Um, those types of crimes will now be classified as hate crimes. Uh, thanks to this le piece of legislation, so that we know that if someone is being targeted because of their race or their ethnicity, then those should be hate crimes. They're not just robberies. They're not just harassment. They're hate crimes. 
Um, we also know that uh, um, you know the AANHPI um, community has really endured significant just devastation this past year, um, and uh, within the uh, No Hate Act, um, which is part of the the, the COVID nineteen hate crime bill, was um, a historic step, which is to provide the federal resources to incentivize states to establish online reporting of hate crimes to make it easier to report. There's a lot of folks within uh, minority communities, they just don't know where to go, or they don't, they may be undocumented. They, they don't want to go into a police station to report a hate crime. But if you made it online, it makes it a little bit easier for people to be able to do that. Here we go. Thank you for that. Sorry about that, folks. I want to start with Representative Don Gershwitz. You know, you heard her clip. I'm sure you're familiar with, um, you know, the uh, what this Hate Crimes Act can do for us in Illinois. Can you say a little bit more about maybe what the state of affairs is for, with regard to hate crimes, specifically targeting Asian Americans, and what you think the act can do to help the community? Yeah, so, um, well, first of all, I mean, you know, just um, having the opportunity to have this conversation is something that is new. Um, and, I, and I think, I, you know, is a direct result of increased awareness, um, which is, you know, frankly, I think um, my experience, uh, you know, is, as a, a Asian American woman, um, you know, throughout my life has been one of invisibility. Um, Asian Americans are often just simply left out of the conversation on race, um, left out of the conversation, you know, when you have um, uh, reports of, of hate crimes, um, you know, Asian Americans, I think, frankly, um, are often underreported. Um, this is, you know, not surprising to those of us um, in the Asian American community who um, know, you know, from our own family's experience, um, you know, that there is often a, a tendency um, not to want to be seen um, because our, our history has been one where um, visibility often results in uh, discrimination. And so silence um, is a coping mechanism. Silence is a survival mechanism. It's something that, you know, I know um, because I hear it in the community, um, that it's only after somebody else comes forward that you hear somebody else say, well, that happened to me. Um, we recently had an incident of an anti-Asian provocation um, in, in my community. Um, and it was only after um, conversations were initiated really from young people, from the next generation, where I heard others come forward and say, you know, at the start of the pandemic, um, you know, a, a woman said, you know, I was at the grocery store and teenagers threw eggs at me, um, but I didn't report it. And, you know, it, it, it's heartbreaking, um, but at the same time, encouraging to me that, that because we are now seeing things like the Hate Crimes Act being passed in Congress, we're hearing people starting to come forward. My hope is that um, we will create some muscle memory around having these conversations, around the necessity to report hate crimes in our communities so that we can have a more accurate accounting of what's really happening in our communities. Um, so for me, you know, um, initiatives like the Hate Crimes Act being passed by Congress, like uh, organizations um, that have uh, started to become more prominent, like Stop API Hate, um, that we will see more accurate statistics, more accurate reporting of hate crimes in the API community. Um, and then we can take action. Um, you know, one of the things that is incredibly difficult as a policymaker um, is to uh, 
you know, it, it's very difficult to um, draft policy around anecdotal evidence, right? Um, one of the things that I've been focusing on is trying to disaggregate data in the Asian American community. Because while it is incredibly important and necessary and powerful um, to galvanize around a political identity, Asian American, um, when it comes to a policy making around issues involving poverty and health care, it is important to disaggregate data. Because while um, Asian Americans, you know, as an aggregate, um, might have poverty rates, for example, um, similar to the national average, when you disaggregate that data, you find some surprising statistics. Like, for example, the poverty rate um, among Americans is close to 40%, much higher than the national average of 12%. And you, would, you might miss the opportunity to direct resources to communities that need it if you aren't looking behind um, you know, the, uh, you know the, the widely held assumptions about Asian Americans mm -hmm. and actually look at the data. You know, and I hope we can talk a little bit about the model minority myth, where that comes from, how that operates to silence communities mm -hmm. um, and uh, prevent the, not only the reporting of hate crimes, but also prevents uh, resources going to the Asian American community where they're needed. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. You know, Sanyang, I wanna um, ask you to enter in the conversation, specifically using that gender lens. You know, when, when, the, when Representative Gong Gershwitz talks about disaggregated data, I know that you came out with a report with Stop API Hate saying that of all the different hate incidences that have been reported, self-reported, 2.2 uh, times more women and girls reported over men. So that really speaks to a important uh, dimension to the conversation. But before I let you respond, uh, Tammy, uh, Senator Duckworth um, had a few more words about that point and I'd like to play that clip and then I'll let you uh, respond and share. Well, you know, within the community, um, women have been particular targets of, um, of criminal activity because um, in particular, A and HBI women are seen as subservient, meeker, um, you know, uh, uh, much less willing to stand up and, and, and fight. And so that has always been the stereotype. It's not true. I mean, you know, I tell people you're married to an Asian woman, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, uh, they're not meek or mild at all. But, but that has been the, the, the stereotype. And so what happens is Asian women, especially elderly women have been the targets of, of, of these instances. I mean, my own mom is, is 80 years old and she's always experienced sort of like little snide and snarky comments, you know, go back to your own country, you know, oh, make fun of her accent, you know, um, that sort of thing. But she started to, I mean, I, she came home one day she had gone to the grocery store to buy fruit for my daughter's school lunch. You know, she, she wants to make sure her granddaughter uh, gets, gets a piece of fruit in, in her school lunch and she's trying to buy some grapes and she's at the grocery store and a woman and a store employee um, kept shoving her out of the way as they were arranging the, the fruit. And my mom would walk over and, you know, and find an employee just says, you know, you're in my way, get out of my way. And my mom's like, you know, please, you know, I, I'm just trying to get some fruit. And she's like, and the woman looked at it and said, well, you know, I have to wear this mask because of you. This is, you know, this is the, this is the virus that came from, from, from you Asian people. And, and this is because of you that I have to do this. Um, and I have to, you know, and, and my mom was like, listen, I'm not here to fight you. I'm just here to buy some grapes for my granddaughter. But it shook her up and she came home and it shook me up. You know, the idea that my mom is out there trying to, you know, buy a school, stuff for a school lunch. And she's the target at a grocery store. You wouldn't, you know, and so these attacks can happen anywhere, and it is particularly scary for the community. I, I know lots of folks who are not letting their elderly relatives go out by themselves or, or, or at all um, during this time period, and, and you know, that's that's not acceptable either. Mm -hmm. Yang, some yeah, thoughts I mean, on that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we did release a joint report with Stop API Hate. Uh, you know, using their data and actually uh, NAPOF conducted a national polling at, at the beginning of this year um, of Asian American, it was the largest poll of Asian American Pacific Islander women who had voted in a general election, right? So we had, and we, it was a national, it was a national poll and 
What was really astounding about that was that over 90% of the respondents said that they have experienced some sort of racial experience in the last 18 months. Of that 90%, 70% said they have experienced a racial incident uh, in public in the last 18 months, right? So what's being reported is, again, a very small representation, right? Um, and I would I would venture to guess if we were to do a polling of Asian Americans that actually the 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 ratio of women being impacted more than men would actually be much bigger, right? Because these are smaller samples, and and in that in the report we jointly released with a, a Stop API Hate, the other thing we noted is that women and elderly are much more likely that the incidences reported by women and elderly are have happened to them in public spaces from strangers, right? Men are reporting more like coworkers saying things to them or housing discrimination or avoidance, but women are the ones that are reporting the more aggressive behavior that we experience in public, right? And, you know, people are like, well, why do you think that's that? And I'm like, well, do you walk around this world with your eyes closed? Because do you not realize sexism also exists, right? Like we have been dealing with sexual harassment as women, at, you know, like forever and a day, right? And I remember, you know, they're like, oh, is this like a new thing for APAC community? And I was like, no, it's been around forever. But actually the first time we experienced a spike in incidences was actually when Donald Trump got elected, right? Men felt like they could go around saying all sorts of things to women. And we were, I mean, like people, like our members who are, you know, sort of younger uh, professionals reportedly said, you know, like people, like they are much more afraid to be out on the streets, right? And so this is way long. And, and so layered with that, right? With the sexism that's already targeting us, like now you layer that with the, racism and COVID related violence. And, you know, to send the senator's point that um, Asian women are Asian women are seen as easy targets because the stereotype of our Asian women are that we're submissive and we're docile and, you know, we're, we're pushovers and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to fight back. We're not going to be loud, you know, and and that is that is, in fact, what many of us experience. Right. One of the things that was so shocking to me was um, after the Atlanta shooting, I, um, you know, because of our work and our organization's work, I, I did about 200 interviews um, in about a, a span of a week. Um, and one thing that was very consistent that really just really has seared in my memory that I will never forget is how often reporters, producers, editors that I spoke with had no idea that Asian American women being targets of sexual harassment was a thing. And I, you know, they were like, well, are you surprised that this has happened? And I tell, take that back. I'm like, you know, most of y'all, the ones that know, right, start with our history of discrimination with, with the Chinese Exclusion Act. And I'm like, actually, three years before that, there was something called the Page Act, right? And, and literally, you have reporters and people like, they, they have never heard of it. And they are like, oh my gosh, we had no idea. And, and they had no idea that so many of us have had similar experiences of being hypersexualized and being objectified and targeted because of the way we look, right? And um, I, I swore to myself after that week that, you know, like as far as, as long as I'm in this job and leading this work, like they're like, we cannot have 20 years go by and another incident happen and another ED at Napoff getting these calls and people saying, oh my gosh, we had no idea. Like that can never come out of the American public's mouth again, right? Like I have literally committed myself to educating this, you know, our, our country so that we don't ever experience that again, right? And um, to Representative Gong Gershwitz's point, like one of the things that we also realized is that we don't talk about what happened to us right and so i've literally had people that are like oh my god i'm hearing you on the radio and like why don't you talk about this and i'm like that's a good point like i talk about it with my asian american friends but like we don't we don't make a big deal of it we don't talk about this right and that also has to do with what is considered racism in this country and what's 
what's acceptable to talk about as as racism and race you know racialized sexism and often asian americans are asked to take the back seat because the racism we experience is not real racism right i mean i've heard the gamut we're like you're not really people of color you don't really experience racism look at you like you're like white people like all sorts of things right that how many of us have heard growing up or you know have heard in even recently that really undercut and uh dismiss you know the seriousness of what happens in our community and i think you know while the hate crimes act is really important what i want to emphasize is you know we need to normalize conversations around any any acts of discrimination and um intolerance because it might not rise to the level of crime but that's still not okay right so um i had a i have a friend who has a has a daughter chinese american family who has a daughter in cps and her a couple of her couple of kids in her class at lunchtime started making fun of her saying, oh, I heard Chinese people eat cats and you eat rats and how disgusting and all this, right? And so so, so my friend reported that to the school and the school refused to treat it as a racial incident, right? Because the kids didn't use the N word or some kind of signifier that says that was racist, right? But if we knew our history, right, those, those propagandas about Chinese people eating rats and Chinese people being weird and dirty. That was propaganda created by the United States government when they were trying to exclude Chinese people, right? And so if if this principal and the school knew that history, we wouldn't have to advocate and tell you why that was racism, right? Everyone should know that when you tell an Asian person, ew, you eat rats and you eat cats, that is a racist comment. Right. Like, and so I think there's so much more, um, you know, that goes under the radar because again, you know, the, there aren't these racial slurs that people necessarily use that target us, but we know it's targeted at us, right? They would never say that to another white kid or a, a kid of another, um, you know, racial background um, as a, as, as a taunt. Right. And so we have to find ways to really include all of, I mean, all of that right to how do we capture those things to say and 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 really understand that like just because you're saying it's not a racist thing like the, the shooter right like the sheriff came out and said well he said it wasn't a racist that he's not a racist so he it wasn't a racial incident i'm like well since when do we let the murderer decide what it, what it was right like and you know when i had reporters ask me that question like well do you think this was a racial incident the, the shooter says that what he wasn't motivated by race i said well, that's because the sheriff does not understand racism, right? Like just because the shooter says it wasn't a racialized incident, it doesn't mean it wasn't. If you look at the system, the, the way our system works and how Asian American women are hypersexualized and objectified, it is because we were, they were Asian American women, not just women who happen to be Asian American, right? Or Asian Americans who happen to be women. I mean, it was very specifically because they were and they were Asian American women that they were targeted. And that's the that's a reality so many of us live with that completely get invisibilized in the conversations about women's rights, right? It it usually centers whiteness it, or says it's about all women. And when you say it's about all women, you erase why particularly women of color are more vulnerable and in what ways Asian American women are vulnerable right um and when we say we're only going to talk about asian american hate then you again invisibilize how women are more vulnerable and and the ways we need to address solutions need to be women centered they have to be gender justice centered and that's where we're spending a lot of our time in advocacy with our peer organizations to make sure that whatever we come up with right that we center we center women in the middle of it, right? Does your solution work for women? Because if it doesn't, then it's not a good solution. It's not gonna have the result that you're looking for, right? Um, and so I think the, the the word we like to use is intersectionality to be able to think about both race and gender at the same time. Absolutely, thank you for that. And you know, there was a lot of things that you said that speaks to the importance of teaching about our history, which impacts how we perceive ourselves, how we perceive others today, and how that trickles into decisions 
policies, practices, so on and so forth. So I want to bring um, to actually the senator back into the conversation because she um, spoke a little bit about the TEACH Act. And I'll let her say a little bit about that. And then I'm going to uh, give Representative Gon Gershwitz an opportunity to talk more about that as well. I'm trying to teach them to value their identity. Um, my kids look very Caucasian. They're only a quarter Asian, um, but they don't look, they don't look it at all, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I'm trying to teach them to really value their Asian-ness and how, how, how rich that heritage is. Um, I'm trying to teach them to, uh, um, you know, they're young. So, so, you know, kids really are not racist when they're, when they're young. And so trying to really expose them to the world and help them see the dangers of the world, but in this, at the same time, not push them towards seeing differences between people. So, so I think most, most parents struggle with that. Um, and uh, it's, you know, but it's scary seeing inherent biases that start to show up because of marketing and, and television and the like. Um, and, and so I really have to be very careful in, in what they're exposed to. Um, I think like most parents, and that's something that I've been sort of thinking about and what is it that I can do from my role here in the Senate um, about you know, how our kids are exposed um, to, to messages that are inherently biased and, and in many ways racist and discriminating. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And certainly for the ANHPI community, just the uh, exclusion of ourselves in those spaces, I think speaks volumes. And so countering that as well, I think is important too. Um, right. To the extent of teaching our history, right? In Illinois, we, we did pass this legislation. Thank you, all of the members of the Illinois uh, uh, House and Senate for passing the legislation. We're, we're literally whitewashed out of the nation's history unless mm -hmm. we force it to be taught. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that's important to teach ANHPI history in the classroom? Why do you think that law is important? Because in particular with our community, we're seen as the other. Um, my entire military career, I had people asking me, where, you know, where are you from, really? It's like, Chicago, <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, but, but where's your family from? Well, my family's been here since before the revolution, you know? And, and so there's always this other, that you're not quite American enough um, just because, you know, you're, you're, you're uh, A and HPI. And so, uh, when, when I would talk to people about the richness of the Asian experience in the United States, that we had AAPIs who fought in the Civil War to liberate the to liberate the slaves to keep the Union united. People don't know that, and that we're you know up until Donald Trump, uh, we were the only group that had our citizenship removed after we had earned them with the Chinese Exclusion Act. And you talk mm -hmm. about you know even what is common knowledge among the Asian community with the internment of Japanese Americans, a lot of kids grow up today not even ever learning about that and when I talk about you know we had internment camps uh, in this country and you talk about concentration camps and we, we had camps with barbed wire around them that we shoved people into and we seized their property um, Americans and people say really they don't believe you so everybody needs to learn about not just not just the AA and HBI kids all kids need to learn about that history so we don't repeat it mm -hmm. Representative Gong Gershwitz, some, uh, tell us a little bit more about the TEACH Act, the significance of it. Yeah, well, you know, um, it was my uh, incredible um, honor to, uh, to have been the, the lead sponsor in the Illinois House of Representatives of the TEACH Act, which stands for Teaching Equitable Asian American Community History. Um, and it makes Illinois the very first state in the nation to require that Asian American history is included in our K through 12 schools. Um, and, and I think, you know, our panelists have um, illuminated the consequences for not teaching Asian American history. And of course, I always want to emphasize that Asian American history is American history. We are part of the American mosaic. Our experience is part of the American experience. But what happens when you don't know anything about Asian American history is Asian Americans tend uh, to distance themselves to not connect with their heritage and non-Asians then tend to believe stereotypes because what fills that void in knowledge 
our harmful stereotypes about who we are. Um, and, you know, we've seen the consequences of that um, play out most recently um, in the scapegoating for the pandemic. Um, but, you know, as I, I mentioned, these are not isolated incidents, nor are these um, incidents anything new. Um, and so the best weapon that we have to fight ignorance is with education. Um, the TEACH Act is fundamentally about building empathy. Um, and it's, you know, my view that we cannot possibly hope to understand our present unless we have a full and comprehensive understanding of our past. Um, you know, as Senator Duckworth stated, you know, without knowing your history, uh, you're destined to repeat it. Um, and here's just one example, you know, of, um, I, you know, how, how persisting uh, the fetishization and hypersexualization of Asian American women has been in this country. Um, you know, many of the bar associations are now doing a reenactment of the case of Lung versus Friedman, uh, which is uh, the story of 22 lewd Chinese women from 1876, um, where Chinese women, women traveling without husbands were detained at the port of San Francisco, right? So when we talk about sexualization, racial profiling, human trafficking, um, this goes back um, to the earliest um, you know, in, in uh, uh, stereotyping of Asian American women, uh, hypersexualization of Asian American women, and um, the, you know, codification of those stereotypes, um, both in uh, immigration laws, but then also um, in cases like, um, you know, Lung versus Freeman, um, where these stereotypes were uh, normalized through our judicial system, normalized um, in statute. Um, so much so uh, that in uh, Justice Harlan's dissent, um, very famous you know, dissent uh, where he you know, uh, maligned and rightly so separate but equal, it barely escaped, you know, barely uh, caught anyone's attention uh, that in that famous dissent, he said in speaking about Chinese Americans, a race so different from our own that we don't allow them to become citizens. And again, that's that, that normalization of this stereotype of Asian Americans as a perpetual foreigner. Um, you know, my father, uh, yeah, I, I'm the granddaughter of Chinese immigrants on my father's side, and uh, yet throughout my life, people would say, well, where, where are you from? Where is your dad from? You know, and I would say Portland, because that's literally where he was, he's from. He was born in Portland, Oregon. Um, of course, understanding that what they were getting at was, you know, um, where, you know, you know, the Gong family uh, immigrated from. Um, and then, you know, you, know, you, you constantly have, um, you know, uh, the reminders throughout your life um, that you're somehow foreign or different um, in the bullying that you experience in elementary school um, or the comments that are meant to be, I think, complimentary, but are incredibly belittling for Chinese American women, for Asian American women. Um, you know, and, and you know, uh, those are just common experiences that come from ignorance. Um, so the TEACH Act, for me, fundamentally, is ensuring that the next generation sees themselves in their wholeness, their completeness, the contributions of Asian Americans to this nation. Um, you know, an example, you know, Tate versus Hurley. It was a case brought by a Chinese American family that desegregated California schools 70 years before the Bo Brown versus Board of Education. Um, this is part of the, the uh, Asian American experience. We have been agents for change throughout American history. Um, but in the absence of those stories, um, we can't see the completeness and the wholeness of the Asian American experience in the American experience. And so for me, um, you know, the TEACH Act was an incredibly personal piece of legislation, um, you know, one that I am committed to seeing implemented in the way that we have envisioned it, which is that it is not enough to teach uh, the Chinese Exclusion Acts and Japanese internment. Um, that would be a very, you know, narrow view of Asian American history that, you know, the intent of this bill is to provide a complete understanding of the Asian American experience, which is part of the American experience. Um, and we'll be working very, very hard to ensure that the bill is implemented 
the way that we had envisioned, which is inclusive and comprehensive. Thank you for that, Representative Gong Gershwitz. We are at our end of our time, unfortunately. Um, I wish we had another hour, uh, but I would like to nonetheless close uh, with your voices in the end. And I'll start with Sung Young. You know, this is where we say, well, now what? What what do we do? What do we do with the situation? So from your your take on all this, how do we stop anti-Asian bias and violence and hatred? What can we do to make this a better situation? Yeah, I think um, it's um, not forgetting, right? We need to, as uh, Representative Gongorsh was said, we need to build muscle memory um, that we, the, the stories that we're telling, the things that people are constantly like, oh my gosh, I had no idea, hopefully becomes part of the American story that you start talking about and telling when we talk about discrimination, when we talk about race. I mean, the United States is filled with so much, so much ugly, ugly in its past. Um, and I think, again, you know, just referring to what everything that was said was we need to uh, remember so we don't repeat. And I think in, in our case, it's like people need to learn <laughs> and learn for like they don't even know these things have happened to us, right? Like they actually need to not only remember, but learn and then remember because right now people are repeating or demeaning or belittling our experiences, but sometimes without even knowing because they don't realize why it's racist. Like why is telling you that you're eating a cat a racist thing? Well, that's because this is what the US government perpetuated, right? Like, and so it's really about that. And I think we need to do, we need to do more of that. And they shouldn't take knowing an Asian American being married into a family of Asian American or, you know, um, having Asian Americans come over to speak to you about these. I, I really hope that, you know, school districts all across the country, even if there are no, especially if there are no Asian American families in their schools, that they are teaching this history, right? So that um, we, we can go anywhere and feel like we are at home and in, in, in part of our country instead of having people constantly ask you, well, where are you really from? Or look at you like you don't belong here. Thank you. Representative Gal Gershwitz. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think I, um, you know, want to close uh, on a positive note, um, which, you know, is that, uh, you know, change comes from moments like these, right, where we have the opportunity um, to have these conversations. And um, I am always mindful of the shoulders on which I stand. And here I am, the granddaughter of Chinese immigrants, a third generation Chinese American whose grandparents uh, were, um, you know, uh, discriminated against and uh, had to face deportation under the Chinese Exclusion Acts at a time when Chinese people were specifically excluded by law from becoming uh, naturalized U.S. citizens. And here I am, uh, the second Asian American ever to serve in the Illinois House of Representatives, which shows the promise of a nation that can learn from its, uh, its history and, and grow and uh, evolve and do better. Um, and so, um, you know, for me, it is about um, living up to the values uh, that um, we know um, represent the best of us, right? And so, um, you know, I just, I wanna thank uh, the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center for giving this, us this platform and this opportunity to uh, share our experiences and our hope for the future, um, to be upstanders, to be partners in this, um, this conversation about how we work together um, to build a better tomorrow. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, and uh, I hope it's, it's just the, the start of a, a much longer collaboration. I agree. I want to thank both of you for your insights and your perspectives. I think it added, you know, new ideas, um, a richness to the conversation that will happen, you know, over the dinner table tonight. Um, I want to go ahead and turn it to Abby to give a proper close to tonight's events. I want to thank everybody for um, coming this evening, uh, Representative um, Gong Gershowitz, Sung Yun Chamorro, and of course, Esther Herr. 
this was an amazing evening. Uh, I learned so much and I can't thank you enough for that. I would also like to thank um, Senator Laura Fine, Judge Anjana Hansen and Judge Linda Powell for assisting me in, in putting this evening together. Uh, thank you to everybody who has joined us this evening. I would also like to ask everybody to please join us at the museum to um, see Shanghai, the safe haven during the Holocaust, which is still on view through September of 2022, as well as joining us for the opening of Rise Up, Stonewall and the LGBTQ rights movement, which opens on October 17th, 20. 2021 and runs through May 8th of 2022. Please continue to join us in being upstanders and thank you so very much for being with us this evening.